Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Thursday's episode of C-SPAN. My name is Megan, and we're live at our clownfish habitat this morning. And I'm live with Brett, who's going to teach us all about these amazing animals. Good morning, so welcome back um, to another episode. We saw me earlier talking about corals. So today we're going to talk about clownfish and their habitats and the bubble tip anemones today. Um, so these clownfish are um, very special, always near and dear to everyone's heart. Um, they all have great personalities. There are 28 different species of clownfish. Um, we currently have three species in here. So you have your orange oscillaris, which are the kind of orange ones in the front. And we have pink and orange skunk clowns, which are kind of toward the back. They are hunkering down in some of their anemones. So these clownfish can be found mostly in Australia and some parts of Southeast Asia and can be found sometimes north of Japan. Um, they are very special. They can get about three to four inches. Um, they, when I say special, they're very unique. So they will start um, as a male and usually start small. And whoever is the most dominant uh, individual of those males will actually turn into a female. Our largest female currently is kind of hiding in an enemy because we're very up close with her right now. Um, but she is very large. She is right around that four inch mark. So clownfish can be characterized um, in a very particular way. We all know a very popular movie we've seen them in. Kind of that nice orange color with those three to four white bands. Now the question may get, why are the ones that we're currently looking at look a little bit different than you're not used to? So these are captive bred clownfish. Um, these clownfish are um, bred in human care um, to get these different color morphs that you're seeing. So the smaller ones in the front for any of our clownfish um, enthusiasts are black storms. We do currently have five of them in the habitat. And then we also do have some black ices, which are in the top left corner. They have that kind of whiter band with kind of that black exterior there. Now we all usually think of clownfish as a clownfish and an anemone. And why is that? They have a symbiotic relationship with their anemones. So as you can see, we want to pair them and we want to make them as very similar to the natural environment as we have here at the aquarium. So we have placed a lot of anemones throughout the habitat and they will reproduce on their own. So they do spread. Um, we did not start with this many, but they kind of, they butted off and they have reproduced and created more. Um, so they have filled the habitat nicely. I forgot to mention, if you have any questions, comments, you just like clownfish and anemones, just post them in the comments below. We'll definitely be taking and answering any questions throughout this session. So definitely post them there um, and I'll address them as we see them. So thank you for that. Um, but back to the anemones and the clownfish, they will have what's called a symbiotic relationship. The clownfish can live in those anemones for protection. And then the anemones uh, will also eat some of the waste and just other food that they have, they don't eat completely. Now, just like we did see in another popular movie, clownfish will rub up in their anemones so they do not get stung. Um, these anemones can sting you and I if we were to put our hands in there. So we are very careful and we use our proper protection when we are working in this habitat. Um, but these clownfish are not affected by it. They will go in these uh, particular anemones. They usually have one or two that they like of their favorites that they will live in. Um, they are very, very territorial. So they work to protect their territory from other um, predators or other clownfish as well. Um, some of our younger ones you can see are all paired up together because they're still younger and have not created that territory yet. But some of our larger ones are definitely uh, more dominant and will be uh, somewhat aggressive towards others. Um, now when we do add clownfish, these little ones that we saw, we talked about the black storms and the black ices, we just did add them recently. That's why they are significantly smaller than some of our larger ones that are in here. They will develop that habitat, they will grow, they will get much bigger, um, so don't worry. And that's why they're all slightly together right now as they create that territory. But if you have any questions, keep posting them. Um, I don't know if we have any quite yet, but we will definitely answer them as we get them. It's a little early for us. We're waking up with some clownfish this morning. Um, so these are bubble tip anemones. Um, just to step back and talk about them. They are characterized by the nice big bubbles at the ends of the tentacles, as you can see here. Those tentacles will form. Um, it's usually under you know ideal conditions, so we do try to mimic that as best as possible. And for us, we're finding that's with a little bit stronger light and a little bit lower flow, so we can allow them to really to photosynthesize. So these uh, anemones do photosynthesize like a plant would or a coral would, like we were talking uh, two weeks ago when we talked about corals. And they also eat as well like any other anemone will. And we will be feeding them this morning, so definitely stay tuned with us for about the next five to 10 minutes and we will show the top of the habitat a little bit behind the scenes and what it looks like to feed some of these clownfish and some of these anemones. But there's questions, we'll definitely take them now. I don't wanna to get too far bogged down before we answer everyone's questions this morning. 
I have a question, Brett. All of these anemones have amazing different colors. Are they different species or do they come in different colors? So these are all the same species. They do just come in slightly different colors. We have three different color variations in here. Uh, one of them we will see when we go to feed behind the scenes. Um, they're a different genotype, which means they display a different coloration or a different form of that gene. So we do have some red ones, some green ones, and then we have a rose bubble tip up at the top that we'll see when we go to feed, but all of the same species. Great question. All right, we have a question from Christina. Do the bubbles serve a purpose? Not in particular. It is increased surface area where they can photosynthesize. So remember, the more surface area you do have, the more area you can photosynthesize at. Because you're creating more distance for that sun to, to get into the tissue so they can create more energy for the enemies. Very good question. So even these guys right here are clownfish, right? Yes, yeah, so like I said, there are 28 different species. Um, some are orange, some are black, some are a dark red. So those are some of your maroon clownfish. This is an orange skunk clownfish is kind of the common name for them out there in the hobby and the industry. All of our other ones are orange ocellaris clownfish and that's just their part of their scientific name. So what goes into making these different morphs? And this is kind of a product of aquaculture, right? Yeah, definitely. So we work with a lot of our partners that do aquaculture these animals. Once again, if we can work with those groups and those individuals that are doing this. We do not have to collect any of these animals for the wild. We talked about that with corals. I know we talked with Libby about jellyfish and even Sean potentially and Paula with uh, seahorses. But these guys today are aquacultured. So what they will do is they will, if they're looking for a particular color morph, so if we're looking for a blacker clownfish or a darker one or one that's got less orange, we'll take the one that's got whatever that particular genotype they're looking for. So in the case of the black storms, they're gonna find something that's got the most white in them and breed them together to keep trying to push that boundary to get more of that white to show up. It's kind of like um, very similar say when it comes to breeding some other animals when they're looking for different characteristics. Yeah, and we even talked about this with Alyssa with snakes. A lot of the pythons come in these different morphs and breeders will um, breed different animals to have specific colorations. That's always a very popular one. And then other animals are in here that are kind of sometimes missed. It's kind of tough to tell, but we'll try to get a peek of it. We do have a couple um, tuxedo urchins in here. This one's a little bit smaller. If we can get a good shot of it, I'll point, point it out directly. So we don't miss it. It's a blue tuxedo urchin. Um, they will kind of, as you can see, stick things to the top of them and their spines to sort of camouflage themselves. Um, they're very good uh, grazers of algae. As we have talked about, these anemones are photosynthetic partially. So we do grow a lot of algae. So it really helps to have these urchins in there to help keep the habitats clean. Now there will be things living in the reef in the natural environment as well that are gonna be doing this in the wild. So we once again try to really, really mimic that everything down to the smallest detail to keep this habitat as natural as possible. Now we would be remiss if we didn't talk about clownfish changing gender. So Brett, tell us a little bit about how clownfish uh, can morph from one gender to the other. Sure, so we, we touched on it a little bit earlier, but we'll really get into some detail now. So they all typically do start out as male. Uh, they will be small, so we'll, we'll use our black storms again as a reference. Um, they will be small. Whichever one is our most dominant of the clownfish um, will go into a female. So that most dominant female will take over and will be dominant over that territory. So let's see if we can show one. This is our most dominant female in the corner. She's kind of asleep, but starting to wake up. She is all of about that four, a little over four inches. So she runs this habitat. She is the boss. Um, it's very similar to other, um, animal, other animals throughout the world, elephants, groupers, um, some others that we may touch uh, throughout the month. Yeah, and some fish species, the female is the largest, um, but other times males are bigger. So different fish have different uh, things that help them reproduce and grow in the wild, right? Sure, so I'm, great. I'm super happy, Megan, that you brought that up because if we think of it a little differently as humans rather than as other animals throughout the animal kingdom. So females in the marine world are typically larger. And I get a lot of guests questions, well, why, why is that? Why are they larger? You know, why are a stingray, uh, a female stingray larger? Why is a female sand tiger get four or five feet larger than the male? Just remember, the larger that female is, the more offspring they can produce. And that's kind of all that survival of the fittest mentality. That the more offspring and the more genetic material you can pass down, the more beneficial it is. So the females are much bigger um, than the males because uh, the males are not holding eggs, not um, you know, creating offspring directly. Um, but the, they will help in the process. So a little bit about breeding of these animals. Um, we'll 
touch on some if we have throughout um, the videos, throughout the couple months as we've been following along with us. The male and female, um, the female, they will, they will breed. The female will lay her eggs. The male will then come over them and fertilize those eggs. However, the male and female both will protect the eggs. So they're going to lay them sometimes under rock ledges. Um, sometimes, like right now, we're thinking this female may be trying to dig out a burrow in a couple places here or over here where there's a lower spot. So she may be looking to lay her eggs. Once she does lay those eggs, her and her mate will protect them and they will also make sure water is being pushed over those eggs um, as well as cleaning off any maybe uh, waste material or anything that may fall on them because they want those eggs to do really, really well. Those eggs, if they're not brushed, aerated, and fluffed, will actually sometimes can get non-beneficial, harmful or beneficial, excuse me, harmful bacteria, non-beneficial bacteria, too many bees there, um, on those eggs and those eggs may not hatch. They can also get viruses that turn light and opaque and cloudy and then they'll cause them not to hatch as well. Um, so very important things, there's a lot of protection going on with them, so they wanna make sure those eggs do hatch and do the best they possibly can. Um, once again, if you have any questions, put them below in the comments um, and we will definitely answer them. All right, I'm seeing a question from Celine. How many times a year do they breed and how big is a brood? That's a great question. So they will breed multiple times throughout the season. Uh, throughout the year, they do have a breeding season. Um, typically, it's at least twice a year, but it depends on the individual and, uh, and the others as well in the habitat. Um, it's a good thing for us to see if they are breeding in their habitats, that means we've created a, so a safe place with plenty of food and no stress. So if they have all those good factors going into their habitat, they're gonna spawn because they feel protected. Um, something we may touch into on another day. Uh, we do have some uh, other animals that are holding eggs currently. They're very unique. Um, now, how big are those broods? They're gonna be several hundred eggs. Uh, it all depends on the female. If the female's a little bit smaller, she may only have 200. If the female's much larger, she may have more than that, maybe five, six, seven hundred. So it all depends on those females. And if it's their first time spawning, they may have a little bit less because they're smaller. They're not, they're not, they've not learned how to do it. They're not pros yet. But as they get older, these animals can live with us 25 years plus. So they're gonna be with us for a long, long time. So they're gonna get really good at that breeding and um, keeping those eggs alive. So very good question, Celine. Thank you. And we had a question from Tegan. How long do the clownfish live for? And you just touched on that. Yeah, so it depends. You know, I, there's in, in, in the wild, you're not gonna to get to 25 years, um, but in you know, uh, human care like this, where they have no predators, they get seafood, or, I'm sorry, um, high quality seafood and food every day, which we're gonna go through and feeding. You guys will get to see that this morning. Um, so they're going to live to be 20, 25 years, and we expect that age. Um, so we're hopeful for that. Um, and these guys have been with us for a very long time already. So we're very excited. And we're always adding new ones to these animals. If you have been to the aquarium in the last couple of years, they used to be in a different habitat. Well, these animals are getting bigger. They're getting more anemones. We wanted to give them more space. We definitely wanted to move them into a much larger habitat. They're probably about two, two and a half times larger than the previous habitat. So we want to give them space to spread out and so we can add more additional animals. So very good question. Keep them coming, I love questions. So if you listen to me in the coral, I answered a lot of questions, so thank you. All right, Brett, I think it's time to head to the top of the habitat and get some food for our clowns. Sure, so follow me. Um, we're gonna go in our behind the scenes area back of house that is not necessarily open to our guests all the time. Um, we're gonna follow it, so bear with us when we go up some steps and we'll go feed some content. So follow me, we will pass some of our other habitats as we go along the way, but uh, come on in and so not only were we a little louder, we got to showcase one thing before we go up the stairs out here at the aquarium side. But if you see behind me, um, you see we also do have additional anemones that are with us. Um, so those anemones look like our beauty and our budding off, creating new individuals. We currently have two behind the scenes here that we do feed daily, um, that we will feed here at some point today, um, and they will be introduced into the habitat once they are big enough and healthy enough to go in. Because sometimes they don't they get overshadowed by the other enemies that are in the habitat, so we'll make sure they're doing well before they get put in. So we'll go up the feed, come on up, we've got a couple stairs to go up, and we'll come to the top of the habitat. So welcome to the top of the habitat, uh, our pond fish and bubble tip anemone tank. As you can see, we have very, very strong lights, and the, the anemones are very pretty up here. Um, so these really strong lights are to help us with those photosynthetic processes that these anemones are going to do. 
So very strong lights, it does get quite warm up here, that's why it's a little ventilated. Um, but today we are going to be feeding um, in a small cup, to make it easy for them. This is Hikari Mysis, so it's a small frozen shrimp. It's one of their favorite foods. We do offer them several, four, five, six different types of food. Um, so we'll just different sizes, different amounts, to make sure they're getting a nice nutritional compound. Now, this is their favorite food, especially for those smaller ones. You want to make sure we're offering the correct size food for the correct size of the animal. So we do do get good flow through here. Um, so we're just going to sprinkle some in slowly. We want to make sure we give all of those clownfish a chance to eat. Um, and a question that may come up, do we feed our anemones? We do not directly feed the anemones. As we broadcast food throughout the habitat, we will allow them to catch their food. So I'm going to add some more. And you'll see some of those black ice and some black storms, as well as our orange clownfish come up and eat. Um, sometimes the pieces, uh, they may not like the shape or something, so they may spit it out and try it again. Um, they're all slightly different. So we were talking about our three different types of anemones and our different types of clownfish. It is actually right below the camera. I don't know if we can see it. So this is our rose bubble tip. So it's a very unique one. It is one of a kind here that we have. It's our only one that we do have in-house. Um, very pretty, as you can see. It's got nice orange tips, green. Uh, has some purple in there too, so really, really pretty. It's my favorite anemone that we currently have. Um, actually, we have a second one. Looks like it did butt off into a smaller section here. So if you can see, this is a second one, and I don't want to get too much shadow in there. That's a second one, and there's our first one. But we'll continue to feed. Like I said, if you have questions, keep posting them along with our feeding. Uh, definitely, we'll love to answer them. Um, as these little guys get their breakfast this morning. And they do get fed twice a day, every day. So Brett, we did get a question about these bright lights. What are they used for? So these bright lights put out a very strong wavelength. Um, so they're putting out that proper wavelength for these anemones. So they're used to help them photosynthesize. So we do have five separate lights on here. Um, it is a very strong LED, so we're also keeping the conservation, sustainability, um, theme in check, so we're using a light that's a using a little bit less power, um, but still creating that strong intensity for the, the anemones to photosynthesize. Great example, as you look kind of in your far right of your screen, you can see these nice bubbles. So that's what we're kind of looking for um, as a bubble tip anemone. That's kind of what they're characteristically known for. Um, but great question. Keep them coming. See a couple of top fans in here. So thanks for joining us again. So we have a question from Jennifer. Why are the anemones not fed directly? We can feed them directly. We find that in the wild, they're gonna catch things as they come across them. Um, and we try to maintain that exact um, process. Now we technically could directly feed them or not feed them. They will get enough energy from the light, but we do think that feeding them and then supplementing with the light is the best process. It's what we found that works best for our particular anemones. Um, and we can get really bogged down into what's called a cryptic species with these anemones, um, but we won't go too far into depth today. Uh, maybe post in the comments and I can answer it later on for you if you're really interested in it. And another question from Kate, how many species of urchins are in here? There's just the one species of urchin. We do have the blue tuxedo urchin. We currently do have four of them. They are small. Um, they are continuing to grow. Oh, there we go. I directly feed one by accident. Um, but we, will, oh, we always are adding um, animals to our habitat. So just because you're here maybe one week or one month doesn't mean it's going to be exactly the same. So keep coming and seeing us. I know during quarantine, um, join us on C-SPAN um, and join us for those too as we continue to do them throughout the month. So great question. Now I just think these anemones are so beautiful and they're so amazing to watch. Um, are they difficult to maintain if people have a home aquarium? They are possible to maintain at home. Um, a lot of hobbyists do have them. Um, what you will need, obviously this is a saltwater habitat. Um, so you want to make sure you have a lot of saltwater habitat set up for them. You also want to make sure you have good flow and strong lights for them. As you can see, the tentacles kind of blowing in the current there. Kind of our 25th anniversary theme, right? Um, live in the current. Um, so those are the things you need. These lights you can buy um, retail. Um, you probably saw the logo on some of them. I can suggest things if people are interested in having one at home. You also need to have really good water quality. Very similar as we see a clownfish fighting an enemy for a piece of mysis. I'll give them some more since they're still hungry. Um, as we saw and we talked about with the coral habitat when you guys joined me last time, we need very specific water quality. So we want to make sure these animals are happy and healthy. So we want to make sure we have good water quality, maintaining it, good pH levels, good alkalinity levels. We want to maintain low ammonia nitrite levels. Um, but like I said, if you have any questions or you have any issues with your enemies, definitely put them in the comments. I can answer them. Um, and I will come back. If I don't answer them during this, I can answer them later on.
too. So let's talk a little bit more about anemones. What other animals are they related to? Related to corals, um, as we saw, some of our long polyp stony corals, if you joined us for that segment about two weeks ago. They're also somewhat related to uh, jellyfish as well. So as we joined Libby and we went through our jelly room, you definitely saw all the different types of um, jellies we do have. So just like a jellyfish, they can sting. That is how they get their prey. So I know we talked about not directly feeding one, but we'll see if we can here. Do I have any more food left as I'm running out? Bear with me, I'm sorry. I'm running out of food here. Um, so they will, as they find prey, they will go ahead and sting it on that tip of their tentacles and then they will bring it to their mouth, which is usually in the center of that anemone. Or this clownfish is just gonna steal it from them, either one. Um, but that's what they are similar to. So very good question. So these guys have a symbiotic relationship, the clowns and the anemones. Does the anemone have the ability to sting the clownfish? Are they immune to it? How does that work? So the, the clownfish sort of gets used to it, um, as we've kind of talked about. And I know in a very popular movie, we all see that. Um, so it's something that we have to maintain. So we talked about aquaculture clownfish, right? So these clownfish are reared and bred and, and raised without an anemone. So when we first introduce them, they are not used to that anemone. So they really need to get used to that sting and they kind of get um, used to it or kind of almost adapt to it. Almost to, It's not the right term, but it's very similar. Um, so they definitely get used to it. So all these little guys that we're seeing, the ones poking their heads out, um, it took them about a week or so, uh, five days, to get used to having an anemone to host in. Um, but now they can definitely learn and host in them through over time. When I use the word host, that really just means they have that symbiotic relationship that Megan was talking about. Yeah, and different animals have different relationships with other animals. You hear things like symbios symbiosis, mutualism, paratism, and those are all things used to describe positive or negative relationships that animals can have with each other. All right, Brad, I gotta ask if you have a favorite clownfish species in this habitat. I, I do have a favorite, um, it's a color morph. So obviously I love all my clownfish. Uh, we do have the Ocellaris, which is almost all, most people's favorite, but mine is actually the one that's making an appearance right now. If he runs away, he's a black storm. He's very small and looks like he only has three orange spots on him. He looks like he has eyelashes behind his head and he has one polka dot by his tail. That is my absolute favorite. Um, I just think that's a very unique coloration to have both of the same colors on the same side. They're not always symmetrical, just very much like our faces are, our people are, or other animals are. So it's really rare to have a symmetrical one. Um, very second favorite, and I would say, and we, it's one of one that I really hope that um, it's very rare. It's a very cool color morph. It's actually one of the black storms. We don't have one. Um, so they look very similar to this guy here as he runs away. But sometimes what happens with these color morphs, you get unexpected colors. So sometimes that black and white, um, the scales will overlap and you'll actually get a really cool blue color, um, which is a really rare one, um, but it's definitely one of my favorites. So this one that's kind of in our view has a slight tinge of blue to it, but not a whole lot. Um, very tough to pick up, especially with the blue lights. Good question. Alrighty guys, well thank you so much for joining us for today's episode of C-SPAN. And I hope you enjoyed hanging out with Brett and I and learning all about clownfish and anemone. Until tomorrow, have a good day guys.